we've been uh, we've been talking about what it means to follow to follow Jesus and and to to be a to be a disciple and for a lot of people we've been self-defining that instead of saying what does the Bible say about following Jesus and we're trying to we're, we're trying to get to what does the Bible say on everything and uh, so we're we're going through an extended series on this particular topic I want to start out with this a quote from a biblical philosopher type of guy he said if you want to know what people really believe really believe listen to them pray because your prayer life unveils what's really at the depths of your heart you can declare uh, a theology I believe this I believe this I believe this but what you pray what you pray for what you pray about the content of your praying reveals a lot about what you really believe believe about God believe about people believe about the purpose for your life I also think it's true that you learn a great deal about someone by what they ask other people to pray for them your prayer requests reveal a great deal of your heart you think about your prayer request and there are a lot of things I ask people to pray for me but if if the full content of my praying is uh selfish self-centered focused on what i like what i want uh, and to to the neglect of, of a lot of other things in the world then well that that reveals some things about me that may not be quite where they they need to be the apostle paul he prays and I, there, there are lots of prayers in the bible i shared one of those earlier there are lots of prayers in the bible but paul also asks for prayer sometimes he requests prayer and this one from 2 Thessalonians 3, and we'll spend our time actually in John uh, chapter 1, but I want to I share this passage with you from 2 Thessalonians 3, 1 through 5. He says, finally, brothers, pray for us. Okay, here's what he is requesting in prayer. Pray for us that the word of the Lord may speed ahead and be honored, as happened among you, and that we may be delivered from evil, from wicked and evil men, for not all have the faith, but the Lord's faithful. He'll establish you and guard you against the evil one. And we have confidence in the Lord about you that you are doing and will do the things that we command. May the Lord direct your hearts to the love of God and to the steadfastness of Christ. So Paul talked to the Thessalonians about all kinds of things. All sorts of uh, things they needed to be working on spiritually, working on as a church. And he prayed a lot of things. But central to his drive in prayer for the Thessalonians is that the word of the Lord would speed along and be honored in them. Now, speed ahead. His language just underlines the hope that the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, the only hope we have of forgiveness of sin, relationship to God, and eternal life in heaven forever, that, that it would speed quickly to the ends of the earth. And he just, Paul has this burden. He aches to see the word of God, the gospel, race across the world. And here's why. Because he knows the day of the Lord is coming. That's one of the things you find in First and Second Thessalonians. He has this big burden about the second coming. Time is short. We don't have forever to get this right, to get this worked out, to get this moving. And so there, there's coming a day when for any one of us, there are no more days to hear a sermon, to hear a testimony, to, to take a step with God. There's no more opportunity. And there's coming a day when the end of time comes and there are no more sermons and there are no more testimonies and there's no more opportunity to say yes to Jesus and so he is driven by a couple things he's driven by a sense of urgency that this gospel it has to speed forward and he's driven by his eschatology his his doctrine of last things there are a lot of people who love going and studying end times but if your end times study doesn't drive, if you go to a conference, you read a book, and it doesn't drive you to share the gospel, you followed a false teacher or you've embraced a false doctrine. Because the reason that we are challenged with the second coming of Christ is not so we can say, ooh, we know the secret information. The reason the second coming of Christ is declared is because it creates a sense of urgency that we need to be ready and we need to be found doing what he told us to do and we need to share with as many people as possible because time is short and eternity is at stake. One biblical scholar I read was commenting on the second Thessalonians passage. He said, 
the Thessalonians were asked to pray that the gospel may run well, run fast, and wherever it goes, it may have a glorious reception. Uh, I took that quote and I put it on my desk. Uh, That's just a great way to express the times we live in and the challenge that we have. And really, this is my challenge for graduating high school seniors. It's my challenge to every person here who would name the name of Christ that we would have that kind of That kind of drive, that kind of burden, that kind of focus. So Jesus issued a call to prayer. Now, we've been challenging our church to pray, haven't we? 1002, and I hope that you're doing this because it changes changes something in your heart. It changes something in your focus to every day. And for me, I have my alarm set at 1002. That alarm goes off, and it reminds me, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Pray the Lord of the harvest will send out laborers to the harvest. And so I'm going to pray that because I'm a part of the answer to the prayer. And it creates a focus in me to pray it early, to pray it often, that that I have a burden for what God has a heart for, that my heart is focused on the things that move the heart of God. We call the last verses of Matthew's gospel the Great Commission, and many of you know how this goes. Go, therefore, make disciples of all nations. Man, that's a big responsibility. All nations is pretty sweeping. And... That's a job description that's a little overwhelming for me. How am I going to reach all those people with the good news of Jesus Christ? And one of the big keys is you pray for it. You pray for it. And if we're going to reach our our city for Christ, if we're going to reach our world for Christ, we're just going to have to start praying for it. Because God moves on the prayers of his people. That, That heaven and earth begin to move when God's people begin to pray. And when what we're praying aligns with the heart of God eternal things start happening and so at a baseline this is something that everybody can do because because not only does it start changing our city or our world start changing my heart for my city and for my world when i start praying that god would call out laborers to the harvest and i'd be a part of that harvest i start feeling you know what the heart of god is he's not wishing that any should perish but all should reach repentance That's God's heart. He wants everybody to come to know this. And when we start praying, God starts moving. Now, Jesus broke things down a little more for us in Acts 1.8. And again, these themes are not uncommon, not unusual, not aberrations to God's plan and purpose for every believer's life. He says, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And you break that down, you say, okay, well, Jerusalem, that's where they were, so I'm going to pray for my city, where I am, and I'm going to pray for people who live near my city, but they're probably a lot like me, uh, demographically. I'm going to pray for people who maybe aren't that far away from me, but they're different from me. There's some sort of, there's some sort of barrier that has to be overcome, and in, in any number of categories of demographic somebody near me but different from me and then to the ends of the earth and we say all those things about sharing jesus and it's still not personal is it i want to give you an example of why it's not personal and this is this is the core of it so there's there was a story that came out in 1983 any of you remember 1983 some of you remember a lot about 1983 Others, uh, that was uh, ancient history. In 1983, the Air Force realized they were paying too much for a piece of equipment. It was, it was a little plastic cap that went on the bottom of a metal folding chair. So this little plastic cap that went on the bottle, uh, bottom of a metal folding chair, it cost about 26 cents, the little plastic cap. But the Air Force was paying 1100 and eighteen dollars and twenty six cents for that little plastic cap and there was an officer in the Air Force who asked some questions about what is this and dug into it and discovered that something that was worth about twenty six cents they were paying over eleven hundred dollars for now the problem began this way this inventory item wasn't called the little plastic cap that goes on the bottom of a metal folding chair What the little plastic cap was called was 
NSN-5340-01-0404-4512. In the middle of thousands of numbers just like that. Now, until the officer stumbled on this inflated price and was bothered enough to investigate, no one suspected that this little plastic cap assigned this long number was costing uh, the taxpayers and uh, specifically the Air Force this much money. Now, that's the problem with numbers. Because depending on the person you ask, we look at the world and we say, there's somewhere in the around, depending on the person you ask, five, five and a half billion people in the world who do not know Christ. Five plus billion people in the world who will spend eternity in hell separated from God, who are living on the planet right now. Well, you hear those numbers and you go, well, that's a lot of people. Because it's a big number. But when you, when you change it from a number to a name and a face, and specifically to a name and a face of some person you already know. Because these, these, these aren't just mass numbers. Some of these people are people that you live next door to. Some of them live at your house. Some of them, your extended family. Some of them, you're going to work with them every day. Uh, they, live, they, they live on your street. You encounter them in a regular basis in the circles of influence where you function day to day. They're not just a number included in five billion. They're a name and a face with a story. Working with our existing relationships to share Jesus is what we're talking about. And we all have people we know and people we love who don't know Jesus, who have never entered into a relationship with him, finding forgiveness of sin, turning from sin and surrendering their life to Jesus. And if we're going to share our faith with these people, there, there's some things we need to know and some things we need to have and some things we need to experience. And a wonderful example of this is a guy in the Bible named Andrew. And uh, we're going to tell his story right now. This is from John's Gospel. John the Apostle, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts. John, chapter 1, verse 35. And here's how, here's how John records it. The next day again, John was standing with two of his disciples. Different John. This is John the Baptizer, John the Baptist. Again, the next day, John was standing with two of his disciples, and he looked at Jesus as he walked by and said, Behold, the Lamb of God. And the two disciples heard him say this, and they followed Jesus. And Jesus turned and saw them following and said to them, What are you seeking? That's a penetrating question. And they said to him, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? And he said to them, come and you will see and they came and they saw where he was staying and they stayed with him that day for it was about the 10th hour one of the two who heard John speak and followed Jesus was Andrew Simon Peter's brother he first found his own brother Simon and said to him we found the Messiah which means Christ he brought him to Jesus Andrew brought his brother Simon Peter to Jesus Jesus looked at him and said you are Simon the son of John, you shall be called Cephas, which means Peter. Now, if we're going to share Jesus with people, not five, five and a half billion unnamed people, but if we're going to share Jesus with people we know who don't show any evidence of knowing Jesus, there's some key points that we need to recognize, and we learn a lot of these things in this passage Here's the first thing. You have an outline for this, those of you who are looking forward to filling in some blanks today because it brings joy and peace and purpose to your life. Here's the first thing. We must have something to share. If you're going to share Jesus, you have to have some Jesus to share. John the Baptist had been pointing for a good while. There's one coming. There's one coming. There's someone else coming after me. A Messiah is coming. And 
John had his own devoted followers. He had his own disciples. And they're sticking with him, and they have heard him talk. And now, behold the Lamb of God. In another place, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Like there was a lamb of sacrifice pay, that was representing the price of sin being paid. This is the ultimate Lamb of God, the ultimate sacrifice for the sins of the world. So John sees Jesus, behold the Lamb of God. And what happens is, these two disciples, they follow Jesus. One of them is Andrew. We believe the other one is John who writes this gospel. Jesus turned to the two men and he asked them this question. What do you seek? He's asking a big question. What, what, are you, what, are you, what are your needs? What are your dreams? What are your hopes? What are your burdens? What, what, do you, what do you want out of life? And these two men became disciples of Jesus Christ. And they committed their lives to him. And he gave them what they were seeking and a whole lot more. He gave them forgiveness of sin. He gave them abundant life. He gave them meaningful life. He gave them eternal life. And here's the baseline for this thing of sharing the gospel. The reason most people do not share the gospel is because they don't know Jesus and they don't have anything to share. Is that harsh? No, it's just fact. If, uh, if I was walking through the county courthouse, I'm getting an update to my passport. I'm not, I'm not, haven't been arrested for anything, despite what you might think. Um, just update to my passport i'm down at the county courthouse and i'm walking through the hallway and someone comes out of one of the courtrooms and says we need you to come and testify in this trial well i'm always up for an adventure so i go in and sit down so tell us what did you see what did you hear what did you experience in relationship to this case and i say i don't even know why i'm here i don't know anything about the case I didn't see anything. I didn't hear anything. I have no bearing. This is pointless for me to be called as a witness because I don't have a story to tell about what we're talking about. And the same is true for a Christian witness. If you don't know Jesus as your personal Savior, you're not going to have a story to tell. You're not going to have anything to share. And, and this is the challenge. We, we, we never want to overlook this step. Sometimes we think, well, I just need more training and I need more, more understanding about what to do. Sometimes you just need to know Jesus first. And that's the part that's missing. doesn't mean you haven't been in church and you haven't been in Bible studies and you haven't been around church folk and you haven't done good things uh, with church ministries. But often people have never come to a personal acknowledgement of their sin before God and their desperate need to be saved surrendering their life. I'm changing from my plan to God's plan. And, and it's going to be all new from this day forward. Do you have a story like that? If not, give your life to Jesus. Say yes to him. I believe that what Jesus did at the cross and in the resurrection, he covered everything that needed to be covered for my sin. I'm putting all my faith in that, not that and something else, just that. And I want to surrender my life. I'm going to follow him with all my heart from this day forward for the rest of my life. Have you ever come to a place in your life like that? If not, today is a good day to say yes to Jesus. We have to have something to share. The second thing is we have to have a passion for our message. Have you ever had a dispassionate salesperson? You ever work with somebody like that? You go in to buy something, you really want a product, you say, hey, could so, and you have, to, you have to run and tackle at the knees a salesperson to get them to talk to you. And then when they talk to you, it's like, how much longer are you going to be here? Or uh, you have two salespeople who are so busy talking to each other, they, they won't disengage to come help you find what you need to find. Or uh, on their phone, and that's much more important than whatever you need and whatever you'd like uh, to receive from them. Here's Andrew, and the thing about Andrew is he really believed this Jesus thing. He had such a dramatic experience when he met Jesus he wanted everybody to know Jesus, but not just everybody. He wanted his brother to know Jesus. He, he, he wanted Peter to know Jesus. And he was excited, and he was enthusiastic, and he was all in. And that's why he was willing to tell, because he had just a really good, good case of Jesus. 
if we're to be an effective witness, we have to have a passion for this, a passion for Jesus. Uh, and and other, other people, <laughs> other people, especially people who know you well, they know what your passions are. It's not anybody I've spent much time with, I, I can figure out where their button is to push to get them going on something. The thing that they're driving down the street and you start talking about something, they put it in park and they want to tell you a story. Oh, let me tell you, oh, I ate at this new place. It was so awesome. Oh, my team, I'm bleeding for them. This is going to be our big year. Uh, everybody's got their passion. But here's what happens. When it comes to sharing Jesus, here's what, here's what often pops up. People say, well, I'm kind of shy. I don't think I could ever share my faith with anybody. I'm just, you know, I'm just not a talk about stuff kind of person. I think the Cowboys are going to do next year. Oh, man, they're going to be awesome. Let me tell you why. Because the draft picks, because of this, because of this. Oh, I love the Cowboys. You pick any topic, and they'll go off on it. But Jesus doesn't, doesn't get on the radar much, because you know why? Not very passionate about Jesus. Not all in on Jesus. The seminary professor who said, telling someone about the death of Jesus on the cross for our sins ought to be one of the most natural, enjoyable things we ever do. If we're going to share Jesus with people around us, we have to have a love for other people. This is a really important one. You just have to care about other people. And a, a, lot of, a lot of what gets peeled away on us when it comes to this story is, I love Jesus, just people I can't stand. And we, we don't really care about people. We don't love people. Andrew loved Peter, and Peter knew Andrew loved him enough that he was willing to trust him that if Andrew says this is true, I know he has my best interest in mind. I know he genuinely cares about me. And if he says it, I'm willing to explore it. I'm willing to go with it. I, I was reading a book uh, by Leslie Flynn, and uh, it had a story in it. It was a testimony. It was about an international student who they were offered a great scholarship, and they went to this Christian university. Well, this international student was from a country that embraced uh, atheism, a country that really had, it, it was all about, if you can't see it on, in a science experiment, it doesn't count. And so there were Christians, this is a Christian university, and they know this person is just a long way from God. So they're trying to figure out, how are we going to break this down? What kind of apologetic argument can we build to, to share with them? And different people tried different things and just crashed and burned. But after a while passed, girl gives her life to Christ and wow this and, and, and this is the part this is the part of the story that that surprised the other students it was a student that's very shy you know, not not one of the go get them for Jesus people just a simple uh, girl on campus and they asked the international student so what argument did she use to convince you to give your life to Christ and this was her response she didn't use any arguments. She built a bridge of love from her heart to mine, and Christ walked over it. We just have to love people. We have to genuinely care about people. And as believers in Christ, nobody's better positioned and more called out to care about people than believers. So part of this is, are we reflecting a Christ-like love for the people around us? Because we're all interacting with a lot of people all the time. Do they see that in us? Uh, an evangelist uh, and professor that I have admired for a long time, he said this, it's hard for people really to believe we want them in heaven if we don't want them in our living room. <laughs> Do you really want them in heaven if you don't even want them in your living room? And that's why people aren't coming to Christ. We're going to talk a little bit about uh, living room uh, gospeling uh, four weeks from today. Here's the fourth thing. We just have to have a brokenness for people. It bothered Andrew. He had a burden that he knew Jesus, but his brother, Peter, didn't know Jesus. Are you bothered 
by the law, and this is something I have to ask God to, to put in me. God, I pray it bothers me today. I pray I have a burden today. I pray I have a brokenness today for the lostness of the people around me. That we have to come to a place of, of believing. Without Jesus, there's really no hope. There's no hope in this life. There's certainly no hope in the life to come without Jesus. And it bothers us, burdens us. There are people we know who are going to spend eternity separated from Jesus. It, I enjoy the Christian life in, in all sorts of levels. And many of us are enjoying the Christian life. We know Jesus, but the thing is, we're just not particularly concerned about sharing it with anyone. There's a story of... Uh, the great evangelist D.L. Moody, uh, another generation, several generations ago now, he was drawing crowds, uh, and he was doing a session with Christians, kind of a training session, and in the training session, someone said, Mr. Moody, let me tell you about my mountaintop experience. Any of you ever used that phrasing? Oh, I just had this mountaintop experience with God. Oh, it's so awesome. God just, he's working out, and it was at a conference, it was at a, at a concert, it was, it was in a service, it was in a revival. Oh, I just had this mountaintop experience with God where God just felt so real and so close and so vivid. It was, it was incredible. Mr. Moody, let me tell you about my mountaintop experience. And this is what Moody said to him. How many souls have you led to Christ since you've been on that mountain? He said, well, None. And Moody said, then sit down because I don't want to hear about that kind of mountaintop experience. An experience with God that's that, wow, this is an incredible experience. If it doesn't lead to obedience to God in sharing the good news of Jesus with somebody else, that's a false teaching experience, not a mountaintop experience. And we're substituting a lot of false teaching and a lot of selfishness for Jesus and the gospel. And we need to transition that. There is someone that you and you alone can bring to Christ. And will you determine by God's grace that you will do your best to bring somebody else to Jesus? Here's the fifth thing. We have to have a willingness to share. Now, this is the scary part. Is there a risk in sharing the gospel with someone in your circles of influence? Yeah. Yeah. They'll probably shoot you. You'll be beheaded. Probably not. At most, they'll say, uh, no thanks. Oh, I'm being persecuted for the gospel. Yeah, whatever. Bunch of whiners. Is, that, is it really that hard to share Jesus with someone? Well, they may say no. They may say not now. They... They may say, well, I'd like to talk some more about it, but here's the thing. You don't, you're not responsible for closing the deal. You, you can't save anybody. Uh, only Jesus does that. We just have to be responsive to the Holy Spirit, believing the Holy Spirit's working in front of us anyway. We're praying anyway is the goal of everything we're talking about today is we're praying that God's working already before we get there. And when we get there, we just throw out some seed, the seed of the gospel, the word of God. We cast the seed, and we cast it with abandon. We cast it often and everywhere. And then it's up to God, the Holy Spirit, to, to do the work. But we have to share the gospel. It can't just be, oh, I'm going to be nice to somebody, and they'll go to hell wondering why I'm such a nice guy. We have to get to the gospel to share the gospel early not well we were we've been friends for 40 years and i'm finally going to think i'm confident enough to share the gospel with you share the gospel quickly often early here's what happened so andrew shared his story and experience with someone he already knew his brother peter peter accepted this gospel and then peter shared it he's a different kind of character than his brother he's really and, and Andrew, he's sharing, he's, he's bringing people to Jesus all through the Gospels, one of the characteristics of Andrew. He's a quiet, behind-the-scenes guy. He's not the up-front guy like his brother Peter, but Peter's the up-front guy. A lot of people come to Christ because of Peter's influence. And then those people told somebody else, and they told somebody else, and they told somebody else. And then some people told me. 
And so people told you. And there's some people waiting for you to tell them. Who do you know who needs to know Jesus? And just ask God to fill you with love, his love, and to fill you with the love for that person that needs to know Jesus that's already in your circles of influence. How does this work? I really want to encourage you because uh, one of the things that we have learned and are learning at a whole new level in our church is that we spend a lot of time giving information. We have Bible studies and sermons and we're doing things all the time, sharing information. And then people walk away saying, okay, now I know that. But we don't know anything until we're practicing it. You're not going to get good at this until you're doing this. And so we want to encourage you. We have, uh, we, we've done a couple of these all-day trainings. And we talk about it, we model it, we practice it with one another and then we go out and we do it. And then I have found then the more I practice it and the more I do it, the more I see God at work and the easier it gets. And it grows my competence and my confidence so that I am ready to go at any time. And it takes practice like anything else that you do that you, you become accomplished in. Here's what we're encouraging people to do. Lead out with caring about people. And so this is the first thing really a big first step for most of us just to genuinely care about people and uh, it's 10.02 according to the big clock on the wall and I'm going to stop and I'm going to pray because it's 10.02 Father the harvest is plentiful but the laborers are few and we're praying that you the Lord of the harvest would call out laborers for the harvest and that we would each be a part of it in Jesus name Amen now Lead out and care. That means you genuinely care about people. I'm starting my day saying, God, just give me a sensitivity. Don't let me in the middle, because I'm a person that runs from point A to point B, and I have this schedule, and I have this, uh, that's how I am wired, and I'll run right past people. And I had an experience two weeks ago where God opened up a door for me, and I realized about an hour after I left that place, God, God set me up perfectly, and I missed it. Lead with care. And the best way to care for people is to pray for them. This is an amazing thing that we are finding. Uh, most, most adults especially have never had someone else pray out loud for them. Ever. Uh, so, so last week, I was at a local eating place. And I was with another pastor. And I was talking to him about sharing the gospel. So it was really on my mind real good. There's nobody else in there. We were at a weird time just having coffee at the place where people eat at other times. There was a person that was there to, uh, we were paying out. And uh, we struck up a conversation with the person at the register. And I said, uh, you know, there's nobody around right now. I'm not real busy. And so, uh, we're, the two of us, we just believe prayer is a big deal and it makes a difference, made a difference in our life. Is there, is there anything I could pray for you? And her response was common to what we've run into in those conversations. She said, no, what? I said, is, is, there, is there anything? We, we just believe prayer is powerful. It has been for us and we, one of the ways we care for our community is to pray for them. Is there anything we could pray for you? And she said, Pray, pray for me? No one's ever asked her this question before. She, I said, I mean, see, you have a wedding ring on. You have family, kids. She said, we want to have a baby. This is someone I'd never met until that moment, never seen until that moment. But she laid that one on the table the first time we talked. Because it's a big deal in her heart. And we prayed for right there and not catching up on my quiet time, just a couple of sentences prayed for. And I look up and she's just sitting there looking at me with big teary eyes. And then about 20 people came in. And I said, hey, we'll circle back. I'd love to talk to you some more. But no, I'm going to continue to pray for you. Thanks. Well, prayer is powerful. And it opens doors and it softens hearts. And it moves in people. So just, you're talking to people all the time, and they're volunteering all kinds of stuff. You don't have to push very hard to get to the heart of where people are. And so when you're talking to people, 
Just say, could I pray for you about that right now? And then pray right there, right now, real quick. Then maybe there's a way to connect with their story. You see, this is an important part of it. Because when she shared that, I incorporated a little bit into my prayer because I saw the crowd coming into the parking from the parking lot. I knew I had a limited window there. And I said, uh, in my prayer, I mentioned that you know, Rhonda and I had a time in our life when, when we were praying that same thing and it seemed like God, was, God wasn't hearing that prayer, and, but then he did. And so, God, I know that you work in these things. And I just incorporated that into my prayer, but this is a key part. Connect with their story. There was a time in my life. And maybe you haven't had their exact situation, but you say, you know, there was a time in my life when I was, I was afraid, I was alone, I was broken, I was sick, I was despairing, I felt so lost. And then, and then... Jesus comes into that situation. Jesus comes into my life and and I and I and I put all my faith in him and I surrendered my life to him and and now because of Jesus in my life I have a I have a peace, I have a hope, I have a future, I have a purpose, I have a direction. You, you, 15 seconds you can tell a there was time in my life before Christ where it was hard, but then Jesus comes to bear and now, it's all different. And do you have a story like that? No matter what they say at that point, it's easy to just to jump in and say, could I? And again, there are times when you can do it, when there's time, when there's space, when it's appropriate, because you can't do it when... Let's just hold off on these 20 people who just walked in, and uh, I'm sure they can figure out how to make their own food in the back, and we will... There's a time and a place, but... Could I, could I share with you the story that changed my life? The story that keeps on changing my life. And then we want to encourage you to be accomplished in sharing that three circles presentation of the gospel because it's short, because it's simple, and because it's a diagnostic tool to let you know exactly where their heart is before God. How many of you, as some of you have done this in the all-day trainings, about 90 people have gone through the all-day trainings, Several of you have done this in your Bible fellowship groups. How many of you, you say, if I had the opportunity, I could sit down with someone and on a little piece of paper, I could draw that three circles presentation of the gospel, present it to anybody, anywhere. How many of you? Raise your hand high and bold. Yeah, all over. A lot of our students have been through this training. Yeah, all over. And we're going to keep on doing this. We're going to keep on practicing. And we're going to keep on getting better at it as we go forward. Now, one of the things that happens in sharing the gospel is you may have to apologize. Because a lot of these people, I'm talking about people you already know, and they're going, where have you been for the last 20 years we've known each other? Why are we just now getting around to this? And you may have to say, you know, I want to apologize. We've talked about a thousand and one things. You may not know this about me, and uh, that's sad, but uh, I, I'm a, I'm, I, I believe in Jesus, and it's, it's real and it's personal for me and I'd just like to share my story with you. And, you know, you can say, you know, I, I thought you might think I was a religious nut. You can come up with any excuse you want for why you haven't yet, but don't let it continue to be an excuse. You just share Jesus with somebody. And your story of faith. And at 15 seconds, don't, don't, don't give them, and it was night, it, the night was sultry. It was 1967. And no, no, you don't have to go back and make it a big 15 seconds and get straight to the story of Jesus. The Bible, Psalm 96, each day proclaim the good news that he saves. How about that? So that's my goal. Each day I want to tell this story. I've told it to people who are already believers. I've told it to people who are not believers yet. But I'm, my goal is to share this story every day with somebody somewhere. The gospel. Now, Jesus said, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. Fishing and following go together. You can't separate those two things out. A lot of people say, oh, I'm a follower of Jesus. I just don't do anything he told me to do. Well, th that's not following. And so the key to spiritual fishing is to identify your personal spiritual pond. Your personal fishing pond. And this is what we call our circles of influence. Where do you start those closest to you? Mark 5, 19. Jesus told a guy who 
just give his life to Jesus. He says, go home to your friends and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. Go home to your friends and tell them what Jesus has done for you. So this is what we're looking at. You have that little chart in your program today. If you don't, grab a bulletin on your way out because there's a chart. You put you in the middle circle, and then you have circles of people you know. And they're family members, immediate family, extended family. There are neighbors. There are friends. There are people you work with, people you go to school with. And then those random people like uh, me at the restaurant that I just ran into because I was doing business somewhere. At a place I go to a lot, so I'm going to see her again. I, I, I shared with a woman at Kroger that one of our church members has been sharing with. And so we're, I'm at the same place, so I went there. I got to share again with her a uh, week before last on my regular grocery run because I'm going to see people I see regularly. Always be ready. Always be looking for opportunity. So I have people that are neighbors, people who are friends, people who are family in my circles. And here's the goal. You can take that little chart and you can throw it away on your way out. Or you can start here. And this is, this is where you get in the game. This is where it becomes real. It stops being a lot of people who don't know Jesus and it starts being people you know. Here's one of the challenges we have run into. People say, oh yeah, I know people who don't know Jesus. Here's uh, this person and this person. I don't know many people who aren't Christians. Shame on you. Shame on me. Because God sent us out in the world to share the gospel. And a lot of people that you, you assume are Christians, they don't know Jesus at all. Because no one's ever asked them. And you've never asked them. Don't assume anybody is a believer. That's why you've got to share the gospel at church. I'll share the gospel over and over and over again in here. Some of you have been members and you've been baptized, uh, confirmed, sprinkled, dunked, and a dozen other things. But I'm not going to assume anybody's a believer until they've heard the gospel and they've responded to it. And there's some sort of spiritual fruit that gives evidence of it. So think about people you know. So Andrew shares with his brother, family, co-workers, Matthew. We're going to do this in a month. Matthew, he's a tax collector. He gives his life to Christ, says, I'm going to follow Jesus. And the next thing he does, well, he doesn't know anybody but other terrible tax collectors. So he just pulls them all over to his house and says, hey, you guys want to meet Jesus? He invites Jesus over. He just, he's reaching out to people he knows who don't know Jesus. There, there's uh, the woman at the well. She, she makes her, I'm following Jesus. I believe he is who he says he is. And she runs into town and tells everybody she knows because she's got friends, she has neighbors who don't know Jesus. The woman at the well with Jesus, Jesus just goes and sits down at the well and here comes this woman and Jesus just says, hey, you think I get a drink of water? She's, she is the random divine appointment. Jesus just always watching, always looking, always checking to see pushing against the door of a heart to see if maybe it will open. And we're to do the same. There are people all around us who need to know Jesus. And here's what I want you to do. I want you to fill that in. You don't have to fill in every blank, but in every one of those circles, there's somebody you know who doesn't know Jesus. And you have to stop being a number and start being a name and a face. To write down a name and keep that little chart in place you're going to see it and pray every day for the people in your circles and then see what God starts doing. Because you can't make it happen. But when you start praying, God starts making it happen. And we have a lot of stories going right now of God doing that kind of work. So if you'll just take this step, just one step. This is, I, this is a tall ladder for a lot of you, I know. This is a low rung on the ladder. Write down names. Keep that chart in front of you. Pray for it every day. And then watch to see what God is doing and where God's at work. And then move. God's always at work. Take a step. You can do this. This is, this is easy. This is easy.